Another story from a hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Brick Building a Park. Hello there. You know Grays Harbor has its history pretty well under control. You know just about when the first white men came to the harbor. Robert Gray is our number one man. And we know when the first government survey pa parties passed through. And other early comers passed this way. Because they never failed to leave a comment in their records about this little estuary, its big trees, its wildlife, and its drizzle of rain. Back in 1905, local history got quite a going over when an item of historic interest turned up to start the controversy all over the harbor and for some time afterwards. And before it was through, almost every harborite who knew something of the background of the region had to have their say about what has been discovered and contributed to the lore of the place. And of course, there were finally the last words and the right answer at the end of the controversy. So we'll dust off the page of the scrapbook tonight that has to do with the building of the electric park in 1905 and something the workmen discovered. And note what came in it. Now the other night we mentioned some of the story of the building of the electric park. We told you that it came about as a result of a promotion for the Electric Street Railway Company and their attempt to anchor their rail line to a spot between the two cities that would be best served by streetcars. Edward C. Finch and Jay Carey were two big wheels in the venture, and they went ahead with the development of the park on an all-out scale. They built the Electric Park Baseball Diamond, the Dance Pavilion, they cut down the hills for to form Kidder Bluffs and filled the flats and diverted the stream and in general changed nature enough to provide the two cities with a rather sumptuous playground between. In fact, it was a major construction job by the time they were through. Pilings were driven to support the grandstand, several thousand yards of earth were moved on small narrow gauge rails and the clearing had to be done to make a hole in the dense underbrush was a major chore of itself. The Electric Railway Company had quite a crew of workmen on the job, and while they were clearing the area near the base of what is to be Kidder Bluff, or was until earth movers cut the hill and it be began to haul it away, while they were clearing away the area near the bluff, a swamper chopped through a thick growth and found a pile of handmade bricks in a form that suggested it was a fireplace. He called for the foreman, who called the supervisor, who notified the management and the company that they had uncovered a primitive house in the woods, and the management got excited. First, history, ancient history that is, was pretty close to the residents of the harbor. It was only 50 years ago or so that the first white men had come to the harbor to live, and most things could be traced back to their source. Yet, here was this cabin, built with handmade bricks that dated back as far as they knew before the beginning of time. Perhaps it was a key to a long buried story of the harbor, a story that has never been told. Was this a historian's point of view? But to the promoters of the Electric Park Venture, who were looking for attractions for their midway, it presented endless possibilities. Jay Carey, one of the promoters of the Electric Park, immediately began the deck, the discovery out in Romantic Legends. It was, he stated, the home of a representative of John J. Astor, who had come out to the harbor in the earliest years of Western discovery, maybe with Lewis and Clark, and had settled here. He had built a little cabin up in the valley of Fry Creek and had lived there long before any other white man had ever known the country. The newspapers got hold of the story and L.G. Humber, editor of the Aberdeen Bulletin, described the building as fallen in ancient decay 
its handmade red bricks in an Inuit jumble tile around the spot where they had settled once there, sparkling hearth fire. He described how the roots of trees had grown around the bricks and how a giant tree stood inside the very walls of the decaying house. This, assured the editor, was positive evidence of antiquity of the structure. Under a shower of publicity, the promoters of the park announced that they were going to preserve the structure just as it stood, or rather lay, with the tree growing inside the tumbling walls, with a brick fireplace in rooms, and surrounded it with a fence and made it one of the attractions of the park. Those who traveled to the park on the street railways would have the opportunity of seeing this remarkable bit of historical evidence without charge. It was a wonderful piece of promotion for the park builders. A few bricks were put on display in Hoquiam and Aberdeen. Now, the first development of discovery was to start old timbers fighting over the bricks that could have come from. Archie Campbell of Hoquiam reported that the Carr family had a brick kiln and made bricks back in the 1860s over on the Hoquiam side of Fry Creek. But the promoter scoffed at the thought that this was a house that was only 50 years old. No, they pointed out, it's obvious from the growth of the tree that the house must have been at least a century old. John Lewis could date his arrival back more than 20 years in 1905, noted the original members of the Campbell family, Edward, had homesteaded on the tide flats near the site, but this house was on high ground. It couldn't have been his. Moreover, the tree was evidence that it was much older than the Campbell's time. And about that time, an old well was found near the house, and the clearing was continuing and the workmen lost one of their members. He turned up in a 12-foot well, standing up to his waist in water and shouting for help. There was another choice built, seized upon by another promoter of the electric park for another blast of publicity, and they took full advantage of it, spreading the stories across the pages of the Aberdeen Bulletin, the Aberdeen Herald, and the Hoquiam Washingtonian, the prevailing papers of the day. The bricks had been brought in from some faraway place, another old-timer avowed. It was established long ago that Grace Harbor clays were not suited for use in making bricks. J. H. Duffy had come to the harbor from Chehalis years before and had investigated the clays with an idea of putting in a brick plant, but he found no clay that was suited for this purpose. Therefore, said the old church, the bricks couldn't possibly have been made here on the harbor. But right at that point, someone pointed out the Wishkaw Valley to Jim Stewart, who was making bricks as fast as he could and who was about to invest $15,000 in a program to expand his brick-making facilities. He had bought a brick maker out of Mansfield, Ohio, to take over his kilns and was going into the manufacture of bricks seriously. And this, of course, crippled the theory that the bricks couldn't have been made on Grace Harbor. Now, the Monticeno Viaduct in the harbor's oldest newspaper, as many of you can recall, and finally the viaduct, the Chehalis County Viaduct, as it was called in that time, entered the controversy. The viaduct observed that county records showed that Edward Campbell had, as John Lewis had noted, homesteaded the lands where the electric park was being built, Back in the early 1860s, he had taken a pre preempt claim on the site and said the viaduct, the house that was uncovered standing in the wild growth of the harbor's swamplands, was the house that Edward Campbell had built. The brick had been made in Hoquiam and carted out to his cabin in 1863, and for three years Edward Campbell had spent part of each year at the cabin site. He had dug the well, planted some garden crops, developed a site until he tired of the project. Then, having acquired lands by preemption, he moved to another location near the Hoquiam River and built a structure there. The explanation came as a bombshell into the plan to the promoters of the electric park to covert the cabin and its pile of bricks into a shrine honoring the first white men at the harbor. 
and all plans for a fence around the property and the erection of a plaque to make it a tourist attraction were hurriedly abandoned. And the promoters turned to the development of more tangible features for their electric park. I hadn't been able to learn what happened to the shrine to the pioneer laborer that was to have been a fence in fu for future generations to see, but it apparently went along with the promoters that blew up in the faces of those behind it. We're going to get off the subject for just a few minutes to clean up some unfinished business since we found a rather sketchy outline of a story of a baseball on the harbor several old timers have come forward with information on early baseball teams of the district. Ray Sherwood provided the data on the first organized ball team for the town of Aberdeen. It was called the Square Dill Team and wore blue pants and purple shirts. It was organized back in 1889 by local merchants who furnished the uniforms. Incidentally, it was the year the old-timer Ray Sherwood arrived in the harbor, and he played on the Pioneer Ball Team as one of its infield combination. Then old-timer Jim Fuller, whose storehouse of factual material in the early days of the harbor spans half a century and is well cataloged in any memorabilia that we know, then Jim Fuller stepped up and reminded us that he laid out the first baseball field and grandstand on Gray's Harbor, used for a quarter of a century at the Electric Park Field. We told you that Jim was the club's treasurer, but we didn't know that he had been responsible for the first baseball park. Jim had a string of anecdotes about the early day players and early day leagues. The first league play in a combination of Aberdeen, Hopium, Olympia, Tacoma, Jim recalled, that league preceded the county tie-up of Aberdeen, Hopewell, Montesano, and Elma by one season. The building of the electric park, Jim recalled, as one of the highlights of the early years of the century. It was the focus of all the attention during the construction and one of the earliest promotions of its kind. Moreover, it had two most capable promoters behind it, Jim Carey and Ed Finch. As was the case with the rooms of the old house and the handmade bricks, they missed no opportunity to capitalize on publicity material at hand. And the opening of the park with its pavilion brightly lit for the big dance and the ball game on the new park diamond. We have events on the harbor long talked of. We'll find them some evening in our hometown scrapbook. Meanwhile, let's repeat our invitation to old timers to drop in or write us a card or tell us a story, or telephone us, and have material that we can add to our scrapbook pages. For you, old-timers are the best source of stories and history that is our heritage, and the stuff we find recorded here in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.